so it's my huge pleasure to introduce Will Radik. Um, Will and myself, we know each other since uh, I think 2021, um, when I basically visited the headquarters of his uh, community inclusion currency organization uh, close to Mombasa in Kenya. And uh, we had a couple of highly interesting conversations about community empowerment and the role that money can play in it. Um, but before connection breaks, let me just quickly introduce you to Will's many distinctions. So Will is originally from the United States and he has a, a background in, uh, in, in physics, in high energy physics. But he came to uh, Kenya, West Africa as a Peace Corps volunteer in, in 2008 and became interested in helping the uh, economic empowerment of local communities, which led him to study uh, complementary currencies and actually to introduce one of his own. Um, it was a, a paper-based community currency called Bangla Pesa, which was really welcomed by the uh, local communities, but not so much um, by the local authorities and the local authorities actually got Will and a couple of collaborators into jail. However, Will, got, Will didn't get discouraged um, and uh, improved his communication with the authorities, uh, in, improved, in, introduced a couple of further paper-based uh, community currencies and has recently, or a couple of years back, converted to um, a, a digital um, a version of uh, community uh, currencies, uh, which in, in, in which include a, a variety of uh, really fascinating technological features, but at the same time stay accessible to local communities, just as the um, payment solution uh, in Kenya and Pesa via feature phones. Um, yeah, in some, I, I think Will is, is both a pioneer of, of communi community currencies in the, in the developing world, and he's also an innovator in the technological implementation of uh, modern local currencies. And so without further ado, the floor is yours, Will. Thank you very much for being here. Okay. Thanks, George. Thanks, everybody, for having me. Um, I was going to share some slides here, so let me let me try here. Let's see if that works. Can everybody see that? Anybody can? Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. okay, good. Um, so yeah, I, I think um, Georg uh, has summarized kind of my introduction to, to Kenya quite well. I, I went from physics into behavioral economics and studying econophysics, which is agent-based modeling and got really excited about the work of Bernard Leotard and, you know, this, um, the lineage of community currency and complementary currency research. And I came here thinking that uh, I would implement systems that I had seen in Brazil, like Bancos Palmas and Veer and uh, Berkshires. And, um, and I found that uh, there were already a lot of practices here that were very, very, if not similar, even better. And, uh, and so this is one, um, it's called Mwedia. Um, Mwedia, uh, where I live, um, this is a Kikuyu version of it here that I, I have pictures of, but where I live on the coast here, it's called Mwedia. And every tribe here in Kenya has a different name for this. And uh, what it really was is the, the earliest form of human group pronoun that we have. So instead of you would say like a group of humans or a herd of buffalo, you would have a Mweria of the Giriyama clan. And that would be your earliest way of identifying a group of people that was not just a family. And those would be a group of people in some sort of uh, formal mutual aid kind of network. Um, so we'll get into sort of the how these things worked and and how we've been sort of reverse engineering them, kind of understanding what are the rules, uh, getting into Eleanor Olstrom's kind of management of commons and understanding what sort of non-monetary <clears throat> economics looks like uh, even 50 years ago here in this country. So luckily we have a really recent tradition of it. So on the left here, you would see a, a, a mueria of uh, taking care of children and educating them. So this would be like the elders taking turns, working with uh, the different kids. You would have all kinds of different service mwerias. This would be rotational mutual aid. In, in academia, these are often called rolas, which are rotational labor associations. Uh, Mouse would have called these um, 
gift economies, although there would be a lot of reciprocity measured within these gift economies. So we'll get into how they would measure those in terms of credit and debt in these in these situations and infrastructure medias like building granaries. Um, so we'll, we'll get into a few examples of these. So uh, long story short, though, in terms of introduction to all this, this material is that uh, I came in with a very sort of like uh, monetary hat, community currency as a term and sort of uh, essentially found that currency and money were really sort of colonial concepts and uh, really we'll get into the terms more things like vouchers and IOUs and commitments and promises. So we get a lot into promise theory and sort of understanding economics as management of resources or management of the household and getting into oikos being the, the Greek term of the household being about resources and um, is a fractal like arrangement where the resources that you're managing in economics here, they're called Kaya. Uh, Kaya relates to the sacred forest, the household, as well as society. So it's, it's a really fractal view of tangible and intangible rasilimala, like intangible wealth and in, intangible assets as well. Um, so in a, this is a, a example with three households. So three households are making a commitment. They're making a promise to each other of two days worth of services for the season. This would actually, I mean, much more complicated than this would be a calendar throughout the entire year of all kinds of emergency midterm and long-term types of merias. These are, you know, coordinations of resources. They make this commitment and, and we, we've we been calling this for the last few years an, an economic commons. So Olstrom would have called this an intangible commons. So it's a commons of commitments to each other. And there's still a sense of asset and liability. So each one of these families is creating liabilities as well as assets here, and as well as a balance of trade. And so getting into it, this first family would say, I need to call on everyone to come to my uh, household and help me build this granary. Okay, so I need you to build, bring mud, bring sticks, bring your expertise, and we're going to build this together. And, and then this family is now in debt. So their balance of trade is negative two to the community. There's a lot of different ways that these were being measured, this, these balance of trades. And everyone else is here in, in credit. So this person, this family's in debt. These guys are in credit. It circulates around, it circulates around. Everyone's got a hut now and we've reached trade balance. Okay, so the origin of the term finance as well as fine, which is an Italian kind of concept around settlement or finality, which is coming back to balance. So these guys have reached finance. They've reached finality. So they've created credit, it's circulated, and it was destroyed. Um, they would begin again another cycle. And these credits actually could actually extend beyond just these three families. So, um, so what's interesting about this period, this pre-colonial period, was that there was huge amounts of assets being developed, right? So there would be social assets, there'd be trust, there would be human skills, whole families involved. There'd be huts, granaries, farms, all this stuff being built. This was all replaced after the hut tax with the, with the, the colonists coming in um, with people doing similar types of things, but using money instead. So they would use national currency to um, pool into the middle and then they would take turns drawing on that. In, in French, this would be called a tontine. In Kenya, this would be called uh, often a merry-go-round is, is, the, is the term. So pre-monetary, they had merry-go-rounds of credit you could call this a mutual credit, um, it, but it's not really a mutual credit. There's not one single credit here. It really, it's a pooling of commitments. And so the, the, what I'll call sort of like the superpower here was that each family, each individual, each sovereign agent was able to create a commitment, a promise toward the well-being of the community, and they were able to pool those and effectively share them with each other. Think of it as like a tool sharing or... Uh, a, a combined granary where people can pull out of it. So this is, this is again, really, you might call this non-monetary economics. Certainly there's accounting involved, but there's no generalization here. There's no currency. There is currency as a verb in terms of, you know, the provision of liquidity within the network because these debts could also be transferred, right? So we'll get more into that. So th this is sort of a, a more in-depth example of a credit supply being based on 
audited commitments and services within a community. There's the issuing community. Those credits would be spent, given, sold into circulation through these through these traditional practices. But they would also extend into uh, elderly support, you know, projects like group projects like water pans and stuff like this. And and eventually there would be a market class or a market, uh, occasional markets that would be pop-up markets. These would be things like um, uh, sharing surplus during a wedding, right? Like this wouldn't be, there would be no market class at that time. It would be more like, uh, uh, you know, occasional like celebratory markets that, you know, people coming together with excess. Um, and there would be expiration. This would be a big part of this as well. Like contracts or agreements between people don't extend beyond the season. You know, they might, they might extend up to the year, there would be some f form of jubilee where there would be, a, um, you know, people basically, you know, cleaning the water under the bridge in a, in a few different ways. Um, you know, the worst way of which would be ostracization, but there would be a lot of graduated sanctions. So we can get into sort of Eleanor Ostrom's sort of graduated sanctions related to this stuff as well. I, just to give a view of it, I mean, there was a huge thriving mass of these across most of the planet. So South America, you know, pre Incan, you know, theoretically in, in China, there was a huge number of these types of, you know, um, types of communities that were practicing some form of rotational labor association. It's really the norm across the planet if you're not looking at empire, right? If you're looking at empires, you know, uh, hierarchical civilizations, the ones building pyramids and those kinds of things, you don't see this. You see much more centralization. Uh, and then there was another type of society that I'm talking about here that wasn't uh, focused on that. So um, in general, we think of the, the credit created by these communities as the exchange of promises, the pooling of promises, the promises themselves, the oaths and commitments as instruments. Those exist inside agreements. Those agreements are things like uh, commons management. So you get a lot of, you know, the, this is actually from Ostrom's work. Um, in terms of what did these agreements look like, in terms of how do people manage these commons of um, intangible commitments um, towards services. And then those existed in sort of value networks, um, you know, value propositions by community. So reciprocity being one of them, uh, multi-generational uh, commitments and things like that. So, uh, you know, the, the context in which these things thrived uh, back in the day. Um, I really, I just wanted to put this here as, as, a, as a good footnote for people to kind of get into Mark Burgess' promise theory. Mark Burgess, is a, 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 he was a brilliant like computer scientist that worked on sovereign agents as components and circuit boards and how they could build trusted systems with individual promises. So essentially, like you think about the components and resources inside your laptop or computer. How do you create a system of trusted resource allocation even within a computer? He started to extend that out into human society a bit. And he has a nice kind of uh, um, articulation and, you know, kind of taxonomy around promises. So essentially, I mean, this is very much nutshelling um, his theories, but essentially the ability for sovereign ag agents to make promises knowing that they're not necessarily going to be fulfilled there can be problems there can be all kinds of uh, you know issues the acceptance of those promises within a network the fulfillment of those promises building this virtuous cycle there's more to it than this it's also pooling so if, if this promise fails to be fulfilled can that promise be fulfilled by another agent within a network Right. So the idea that multi agents, so this is like families within these cooperatives here, families within these communities. If this person's, you know, if this person's, you know, balance of trade is negative, if, if that family tour some, somehow go away, what would be the buffer within the network? What would be the risk pooling to manage that system? Well, it would be the other families within the network, right? So looking, you know, kind of mathematically at, at how that works, that's, that's Mark Bridges, really beautiful stuff he's done. Um, I'm going to skip through some of this stuff. Um, this is just kind of going into how, quote unquote, money or currency was introduced in a place like Kenya. So, I mean, uh, you know, fiat dominance in the sense where a few elite were controlling the supply of what we like to imagine was a promise. And I, we can get into this as, you know, what is the promise of the state? 
in in their voucher in their currency um, essentially it was at the time that if you have this thing in Kenya you will not be conscripted into a a concentration camp essentially so there were labor camps so they would be making roads and they'd go into a village and say have you paid your hut tax and they, of course the village had never heard of such a thing and say oh no you haven't well now you're all ind indentured servants to us or you know wage slaves um so that was the that was a method of col colonization so in you know monetary imperialism is still essentially the system we live in today right so that the promise of the state is only that you won't go to jail if if uh, you pay your taxes, essentially, right? Like, so we want to get into a point where the promise, you know, we, we're looking, we're looking for the promise always, right? So when we're talking about an instrument of a community or a state or a business or a cooperative, or even loyalty points of Starbucks, we say, well, what is the promise? What is, what are they promising? What is the guarantee behind this thing? Um, and so that's, that's a question with the state, right? What is the actual promise? And it's, it's certainly not clear. Um, so, you know, dispossession of land in the end, you know, rent seeking, being able to basically control a population. That's how we think of currency and money. And so this is, you know, even the term community currency is something we've really tried to move away from. As soon as you use the term, you're talking about some sort of, in a way, imperialist generalization. We have the technology right now to sort of solve this socialist calculation debate. Um, to basically create uh, a marketplace or a expression of value for groups, individuals, businesses, and merge those into pools. So the, the pre-colonialist colonialist version of you know, what I'm sort of describing is what we're also projecting as the post-colonialist version as well, but using a lot of uh, uh, decentralized technologies. So just kind of historically, to put it in perspective, you had things like medias, which were you had endogenous credit issuers. That would be the, the community itself. You had endogenous like from within the community mediums of exchange. That would be labor or time of labor. And you have the unit of account being endogenous to the community of their choice, you know, like service time. So the community being able to create a credit system internally, that was the norm. This is where we come from. And there's all kinds of versions of this. And I, I saw some talks earlier today that I, I'm not sure they mentioned it, but they were talking about the history of like, you know, uh, King Richard being ransomed using tally sticks to account for the the debt or the, you know, the payment in, in Sterling at the time. So uh, instruments that recorded that were endogenous to individuals or businesses that could record debt. Um, there's a long history of that. So I think it's really, really interesting to get into. And then finally, you know, where we are today, we have completely exogenous systems, right? Like there's nothing from within the community. The bank is the one is the credit issuer. The medium of exchange is totally exogenous to most uh, businesses or communities and the unit of account as well as exogenous. And of course, you know, national currency being denominated in itself is really a, a you know, a, a essentially a, a you know a gordian knot um you know it's a it, it has there's a lot of problems to how you know post kind of bretton woods that the monetary system the the reserve currency of the dollar has been created but we can get more into that later uh this kind of gets into how we work with communities here in kenya i'm not going to get super into it but i in a nutshell what we do is we work with community groups uh, cooperatives generally that are providing services internally. So this, you can imagine this is a cooperative. Each member of this cooperative provides some sort of services or goods into the cooperative. They also sell something outside of the cooperative. And this is, this is just a, a, a mapping exercise. We do a lot of games in community to sort of visualize their interconnection to each other and really sort of understand how did their ancestors, how did their parents, most of these people can even remember as children living in a non-monetary economic system. So this is really just trying to get back to that. Um, we also do a lot of work around, um, you might just call this business planning, but having a clear vision for a community, you know, what are they trying to create? Um, what does it look like in a year from now? They look at their current reality. We break things up into kind of a six asset framework that's natural, human, skill-based. Uh, you have spiritual assets within here, physical, which is infrastructure, like tooling, for instance, 
uh, social assets, which is trust, you know, groups, belonging. You have political assets, which is really your voice in a community or governance. Um, and then you have economic assets. So this is the, the, the promises that are either endogenous or exogenous. So like a exogenous commitment would be holding Kenyan shillings. We've built a, an interface. So we, we I'll get into blockchain in a second, but we've basically decided that we don't want to be hosting a database with this information in it. We want it to be uh, to live beyond us. And so right now, kind of the state of the art of that is these small blockchains. So we use a, a, a tiny blockchain called Celo. There's about 100 nodes in it around the world. We're one of the nodes as well. We've, we've been added to the, the node list. So we're a validator on that blockchain, which means that um, all of the, the users in Kenya, and we've, got, we've worked with about 60,000 families, they don't ever have to pay gas. They have a system where they can connect to the blockchain without any internet at all. So we built some servers on top of the telecoms that connect through what's called USSD, which is like a serv like an SMS system. So they can create an account here. Here's someone creating a password. Um, once they've set up their system, they can actually get a little menu like this. They can have many different vouchers within the system. So that's what we call the promises of individuals or groups, we call them vouchers. And that's that's been tying into a lot of business contract and legal systems so that these are considered by government as well as legal promises. So similar to gift cards or bus tickets. So someone can come in here and say, choose which voucher they wanna send. They might've created one themselves. They can send it to someone by their phone number. This is a phone number. They don't need blockchain addresses or anything like that. They send the amount, they put in a password, both parties get an SMS. And in Kenya, at least, this is a very common thing because a lot of e-money e systems like M-Pesa already do stuff like this. Um, this is what the network looks like. This is, I'll open up, this is like the last month of trade in the network. You can see some isolated and some connected networks together. Um, so what you're looking at here, every color here is a different voucher. So this would be a group that has created a voucher uh, backed by legal claim on their goods and services. And generally, this is done um, with a unit of account being the Kenyan shilling. So this voucher here, like Mando, I, I believe this is in a refugee camp. This would be worth um, 10 shillings of product so every voucher is worth something like 10 shillings of the products of that cooperative right so think of it like a gift card or a subscription okay they're trading that internally they're doing these rotational labor associations where they're pooling it one person's getting it but they're also selling these to other communities as well so there's there's a connection between a lot of these networks this is again like something like the last month of trade this is this would be like a year of trade within these networks um so why distributed ledger slash blockchain? Well, I, ultimately, the ledger, I mean, originally, you would say the ledger would have been everyone's brain, right? Everyone's remembering that, you know, Bob or Steven, you know, he got all of our work, all of our efforts. And yes, he needs to repay that by coming back and helping us with our farms, right? Um the more as that went on you would get all kinds of tally sticks and other kinds of ledger systems some of those would become more centralized than others like through the chief you know the chief's calabash who would be like his gourd he'd be notching and all kinds of systems around you know cowrie shells and stuff like that um the the blockchain in this case or a blockchain um, that we're using called cello it means that anyone has access to this without a middleman it is immutable, means that no one can change it once there's been consensus on, you know, creating the next block, which is kind of the history of the ledger. It's energy efficient. Uh, it's transparent. So in a, the ability to create attestation and credit scores is there as well. So there's a history. Uh, there's interoperability. So there's many vouchers and pools can inter interoperate with each other. Um, there's no lock-ins in that people can exit the system or they can build different interfaces to the system. So that's a big deal that you don't have to go through one provider. Um, anyone can create new accounts over time as well, right? So like refugees that want to escape some sort of identity control can create new accounts. So there's a lot of benefits to blockchain. There's, there's problems with it as well. And we've been through about four generations of it since 2018. We've actually moved to four different 
blockchains over time. And, uh, and there's still a long way ahead. But to me, this is still best of class. If you don't want a centralized database that anyone can, the owner of that database could just change it at any point or, you know, be taken out. So, we, you know, we've been, uh, you know, when we first started introducing the systems, we went to jail. We were, t you know, taken to... Um, you know, Shima Latewa, which is like the fish hole and really threatened uh, quite, quite severely. And, and so the, the consensus was like, let's make sure that we are not the hub that makes this thing go, right? Like they make sure that it's way more decentralized than we are. And so that's how we've been, we're not really trying to expend outside of Kenya as well. We're training groups around the world. This is what our team looks like. We are mostly trainers of trainers so we go to refugee camps we work with red cross we work with universities we send trainers there they can do the whole system themselves it's all open source and we also have a tech team that can train other groups to do this um they don't have to even use the same technology we're using we've got a lot of you know we do legal due diligence to make sure that it's legal within those countries um so that's that's been our sort of way to sort of horizontally scale while keeping kind of a proof of concept as what we're doing in kenya um just in general here, I'll just say that like, you know, using a decentralized technology and sort of putting it at the feet of our ancestors has been sort of the ethos and how we communicate and work with elders and, and community groups that we work with. Um, I was just in the US for the first time in about five years and I went to a like a, this was an Office Max or a Best Buys, I can't remember. And I would see these all over the place, these, these, these curations of value right and so here's arby's and burger king and starbucks and taco bell here's a curation of businesses expressing their value and i would talk to the employees there and i would say well where's yours where where can you express your value or is the only way you can do that through an employment agreement with this company and uh and so if we can imagine the space in which anyone in the world groups you know organization municipalities individuals can express their value can can say what they have to offer in terms of service to society and then we can create pools of these and connections between them i think there's a really beautiful way to bring in sort of the the mercenaries of the world which is all of us who need money to survive and at the same time create you know, interconnected networks, you know, this mycorrhizal fungal networks, you know, between the roots and the value systems that we can transition from, a, you know, a, a national currency dominated imperial, cap, you know, capitalist system into something else. So this is this to me is the transition is is yes, offer your value as an expression of your own time, say, you know, I'm creating a voucher or a subscription for my services. I will, I can initially sell it for national currency, but what I can also do is I can create pools that connect these vouchers together, you know, not just these vouchers, but the curation of community vouchers, the curation of vegan restaurant vouchers uh, together until there's a, there's a flow and a route between all of those. And so that's that's what's beautiful about the decentralized exchange space that already exists in in blockchain. There's a, there's of course a ton of crap in there. There's a lot of shit tokens, but if we can actually start building in, you know, vouchers that represent this woman's tomatoes and and that that teacher's uh, teaching and and start to pool those together and connect them together, I think there's something really beautiful possible, and we've seen a lot of it. So, thank you very much. I I think I've probably talked too much. So. You're mooted, Steve. I'm not sure if Georg is still on. He may be in a tunnel, but I'm I'm just really fascinated, and um, I mean the presentation is is fantastic, Will, and and um, it gives us a breath of fresh air for. You know, we have this huge wall in front of us of central bankers and everything and how you're decentralizing and and then how do we need to work with our imaginations to rethink about money? And um, I'd like to say, too, one one thing for people, too, before questions is you really need to get to uh, Will's. He, I think you have a few websites. And um, um, it really needs 
those need to be explored. And the idea of um, reverse engineering, looking at the society, and you can see that on, on Will's websites that you, how, you know, Will was an anthropologist doing this. You know, it it's looking at the system and and um, and working backwards, and then coming up with this like I'm going to just call it shorthand instead of blockchain this voucher system, and then making it real so people can work together. It's something we we need to be thinking about. I see I I see connections historically and going into the future and in the past. So um, I'm very, I have I happen to have lived among native people, Siberian Yupik, and I've experienced a gift economy or a concern, a caring economy without money. And so I was uh, blessed in that way. But anyhow, let's get started. Carol, you're first. Well, I, I love the idea of a gift economy, and I think that's the ideal economy. And um, and I've been pushing community currencies for a long time, just as a way of raising consciousness. I know Bernard. Um, but your model terrifies me. I see so many red flags because uh, I, I think there is a big push to get digital ideas to everyone and to grab everybody's data. And I just see this uh, serving this uh, horrific nightmare of, a, uh, of the fourth industrial revolution where everyone uh, is merging their, uh, their physical reality with uh, the digital world and moving in that direction. And, and, and I, and it sort of breaks my heart to see the most vulnerable people given IDs and being fed into the monster. Well, they're they're not, Carol. I, so the whole the whole beauty of uh, blockchain, at least how it is now, is that you can have as many accounts as you like, and there's no linking them to IDs. It's only if you want to express a promise publicly. Right. If you want to say, like, you know, I'm, I'm creating a Carol voucher and these are, you know, worth hours of my time, then that's that's a public commitment that you're making. Right. Like that's, you know, so that's that's the you know, if there is some sort of KYC, um, there, there doesn't have to be even that. But essentially, if you're making a commitment to people, well, the. I mean, even a, in a legal sense, there's the liability. I mean, th this goes to Richard Stallman's work on on open source as well. Like you have a commitment, a liability to explain what that thing you're committed to do is, right? So if I if I offer you something, even as a gift, I have a liability that you should know how to redeem that thing, how to create it yourself, as much information as possible. Right. So if I, you know, if I have a relationship with you and I and we make an agreement together, well, good that you know who I am. Right. But that's not on the blockchain. So so if you imagine the blockchain is, I mean, I we can a good example of it is, um, well, if you go to Sarafu.network, you'll see a lot of if you click on vouchers. You'll see that there are addresses that have some vouchers right, that are connected, that are sending it to other people with addresses, but there's no identities on there whatsoever. And so this is a nice thing about the how blockchain works right now is there's always a, 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 a intrinsic right to create as many identities as you want, right? Of course, there's going to be histories attached to identities, but you could always create a new one as well. Uh, it just seems that it's opening itself to a, a lot of deception. Uh, I, 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 it, but I'm I'm a luddite. I don't yeah. have a cell phone. I I uh, hate being forced into uh, sure, yeah, the digital world. I mean, I, our, our, most of our dev team, our, our core dev team, also doesn't own cell phones, and uh, they built their own chips and stuff like that. So that you're you're in good company. And Franciscan monk programmers are are behind a lot of this stuff, and I'm happy to introduce you to them, and you'll have a lot in common with them. And and it, it's a uh, that that ethos of you know how do we take technology and make it uh, modular, community driven, you know all all of this stuff. I mean I, you know we're obviously using it right now. So what is our 
what is our agreement in in this group that you know what what can be done with uh, this video for instance you know is it copy left you know so i love a lot of richard stallman's work like that you know that was the origin of the copy left and you know how to create knowledge commons and how to you know create a space in which we can feel safe with technology so i it's a good topic i i, I appreciate you for for bringing it up for sure Thank you, Carol. Steve, you're next. Uh, yes, Will, very, very interesting subject with a lot of possibilities. Um, I was just wondering when you initially set up one of these local networks, if you have to make some evaluation of the, um, the resources that are going to sustain this economy. I mean, how do you know it's going to work? Mm -hmm. Do they have what they need? Do they have the money or do they have the water? Do they have the land or do they have... And then how do they interact with the wider, larger economy for resources that maybe they don't have? So I'm just wondering what kind of initial study you have to do to make this work. Yeah, so we do a kind of a month long training that's based on kind of three workshops. And the first is just to talk about, you know, indigenous practices, like what, you know, what did, what did it look like before? We do a lot of asset mapping so that there's an audit of the assets within the community and within that network that we bring in the local elders we bring in the chief you know like they're all part of that assessment of you know how do we make a promise right so before you even make a commitment to some sort of service you, there's got to be some sort of uh, understanding of you know what is what is actually possible you know what's feasible within that the second workshop is all uh, what's called a visionary process which is comes out of um, a, a group in Uganda called urdt.net here I'll, I'll stick it in the chat here um, and they've been doing this it, it's actually it stems from the work of Robert Fritz actually about 40 years ago and it's this process of coming up with it's a little bit like business planning but they they work with even you know young women within communities and they create a vision of what is the reality they're they're trying to reach within a year like even pick pictographically they and they do it with kind of partners you know like you end up with an individual merging with another person then that those two merging with another two and it's a very interesting group dynamic process that's 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 very cool building a common vision and then they take that act the the current reality in terms of asset mapping and then they they sort of they do this kind of structural tension diagram they they actually say what's the tension between our vision and where we are now they, they actually take a rubber band and sort of like, you know, sort of say, well, where are we trying to reach here? And then they build action steps and they use kind of smart as a guy, you know, a specific measurable, uh, achievable, um, you know, um, realistic and time bound. And uh, and so they create actions. So we do a lot of that process as well. So they're, you know, they're essentially creating sort of a business plan. Uh, you know, to put it in a sort of modern modern context, and then the the tooling, the media, these traditional practices, ends up being instruments to reach that vision, right? So the tooling comes out of the vision. Say, oh, okay, we have these resources, we have this vision. How do we actually manage our research? How do we do economics now, right? Management of, of the household, management of the resources to reach that vision. So that's that's the process in which these these instruments are being created or utilized. Um, and and you know we we do a lot of different systems with different groups. In some cases, we're not using anything but calendars and logbooks. In other cases, we've used pieces of paper as vouchers. Um, most groups nowadays are using some sort of digital system. Um, and they're using that digital system not just for the internal trade within the network, but they're also using it as a form of financing. And so this is where I was trying to get into the idea that, uh, you know, as much as we'd like to imagine, and I wanted to imagine that, you know, internal networks is it, the connection to external networks is what most people are actually after. You know, they, they're trying to capital raise, they're trying to finance their operation, they're trying to bootstrap. And so this perception where you have a, a, you know, a demand for some, for some product that might be a digital product like carbon credits, or it might be a digital product like sustainable development goals, it might be a physical product like coconut oil, and then you have a promise against the production of it, but then you don't have the money to begin to actually create those products. So that bootstrapping 
is is what we see a lot of groups doing as pre-sales or production loans. Right. So a production loan is if, if I if I give uh, the gym my money, you know, like a gymnasium for a subscription, well, they got money up front. What I have is a credit obligation of the gymnasium. Now I have a, a membership card or something like this. Right. And I'm using that over time. Right. That's a form of production loaning. Right. So the idea that the gym, as an example here, can give a promise you know, for usage of their assets or some sort of deliverable in the future, you give them money in advance, right? They're happy. They have national currency now. You have a promise against production. That for formulation is quite common with a lot of these groups where they're trying to sell product in advance in order to raise money to produce the product in the first place or, you know, to to it. So, that that differentiation between capital or finance you know raising and internal circulation is really interesting and i would say you know a lot of community currency work is a little bit too isolationist and they don't sort of acknowledge that the need of this you know i think of it as divestment as well right so you're divesting from dollars into future utility in these groups and so that's how we work with world food program and red cross is that they're coming into communities they're saying can we pre-buy some of your production from a, a group of vendors a group of local businesses and teachers and then can we give that those vouchers out to idps and refugees they'll use it back with you again and they can see that and 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 ping off sustainable development goals on that. let me let me pause there thank you yeah cheers John, thank you. Well, wonderful. Uh, John Howell. Well, I, I used a, um, a segment of the video that you have on your website in a presentation that I made this summer to a Quaker group. Oh, cool. uh, it's impossible to listen to you without realizing you are speaking a very deep truth about the nature of humanity. We live only in community. And that's what you're taking advantage of. But I do want to, you know, the, the problem that comes up with all of us sitting over here in, in, in industrialized society is the application to where we are and so on. And I did hear you say on that video that, that I used this summer, something to the effect, well, this kind of system works where there is no national currency. As if to say, this system is only needed if you don't have a functional national currency. But that misses something. It misses this sort of nature of redefining humanity in our relationships to one another. But I do want more help you know, in, in, in understanding how to link this to, to my circumstances, to where I live and my communities as they exist here. So thanks. I. I have deep gratitude for what, what, what you have shared with us. So thank you. Cheers. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, this last trip I took to the U S I'm working with um, about a, you know, a, a few groups of black run cooperatives out of Mississippi and Louisiana and, um, and Georgia. And um, the, the idea that they can as a cooperative, as a business uh, create a promise against their future production is, you know, so that that picture as well from Best Buys, you know, or Office Max, where you see all these promises against future production, like, the, you know, my mother who lives in, in the US, um, you know, she's holding at least some five forms of credit obligations, you know, where she's got uh, CVS points and Walmart and Knob Hill and all these kinds of things, right? So the, 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 the legal, uh, you know, formulation of a bearer instrument Right, that gives the bearer the right to redeem. Um, that's it's a pretty normal thing nowadays. I, you know, bus ticket, air, you know, uh, loyalty points, airtime, you know, uh, uh, points. Um, there's there's a zillion versions of this um, out there that we probably, if we start keying into it, you probably realize you've got at least five forms of value expression in your in your wallet somehow. Um, so I think that these things are are fairly normal in the business world. It's not normal for most people, but yoga teachers make subscriptions, you know? I mean, it's not that abnormal either, right? You know, so the, the, the concept that people ought to 
you know, kind of not use someone else's toothbrush, use your own kind of like not use your mom's email address. Why don't you make your own email address? Like, why wouldn't you express your own value? And, and certainly, certainly right now you can sell it for national currency. And so to me, that's the entry point. Right. So this network of I've been watching Star Wars too much with my daughter. So rebels and mercenaries, you 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 know, the, you've got the rebels who you know want to change the world. And you've got these mercenaries saying, I need a buck right now. Of course, that's all of us. You know, we got to pay rent. We've got all this kind of stuff. So that ability to say, well, why don't I express my value to my current employer or to my, you know, whoever is giving me money right now in the form of a promise against my service. And so we do that with our own team. You know, even myself, we create a voucher for our services to the organization, right? The organization buys those in advance, right? So they'll buy two months of my services or, or you know, all of our, our, our team, right? And they pool those together and we draw upon them together. So the idea of curating those, those curations of value, you know, the curating people's expression of value into pools, I see that as what was going on, you know, pre-colonial periods like that, you know, there was no currency to, to speak, but there was credit and debt. There was a, certainly accounting and there was risk pooling. So this, you know, non, you know, certainly there can be network tokens. We're still using national currency predominantly as the, as the unit of account for these. And so it is a, it is sort of a network token, but it doesn't have to be forever. And so to me, this is the path you know, so while all of us mercenaries are needing to get the bucks, if we can build this kind of, you know, mycorrhizal fungi layer, then all of a sudden we can start bypassing the national currency. We could just start trading my wills for Stevens and Johns, right, directly. We can actually route through those systems. And so that's the beauty of what's already been built. I mean, these these networks right now are trading billions of dollars of value on a, every day right now. I mean, th these are pretty robust systems. And so that's what we're tapping into right now, that a lot of this technology and infrastructure is already there. And, and certainly, like, if there's if there are groups of people making commitments, it, it certainly helps. It, it, I, and this is why I love being where I am. And I've you know lived here for 15 years that there are groups of people that already have a lot of social capital together. They're able to make a common voucher as which that would be very hard for a lot of other groups. So that's why I think the path in America and Europe is 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 probably through what's called liquidity investment. So the path to create the pool is through liquidity investment. Liquidity investment is a, is basically a type of curation where I go out and I buy some Stevens, I buy some John Johns, I I actually pool those together, right? And I actually make money on, or not necessarily money, but I make a fee on the exchange between them. That's that's the most common form of investment into these networks that builds this inner inner connect. It doesn't have to be that way. So within a community, they're all chipping into the pool themselves, right? There's no external investor. They're the investor, right? They're the ones that are putting in their capital, their promises, their commitments into the pool, right? So eventually, that's what I would imagine. No one wants to hold. A, by the way, the, all these vouchers they expire, right? That's super important. So no one wants to hold an expiring asset. So what you do is you put them into pools to create utility, right? So if I want to hold an expiring asset as a savings, well, I can't hold it individually myself. I need to allow other people to use it, right? So that's that's sort of the change in, in thinking around what is a savings account? Well, a savings account is when you take an asset and you make it useful to other people. That's savings now. It's a very different concept of savings. You know? So the infinite ownership, you know, the, the, the you know, capital ownership, there's a capitalism thing. That's that's what we're trying to sort of get away from, you know, that version of capital. Yeah. A, a lot of our interactions are with 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 institutions, with grocery stores, with other institutions and so on. And the fraction of interactions that we have in which we exchange services just with other people in our community, whether it's our neighborhood or church, is modest compared to those other interactions that we have. And so that's the sort of um uh, in, a, in a sense, it's a hurdle. How do, how do how do we bring institutions in? I know the Berkshire has brought in banks in, 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 in their system, so it is possible, but it's a hurdle. Yeah. I mean, I think within institutions as well, there, I mean, there's, 
the cooperative movement and unionization movement has sort of missed out on this. And I think, you know, like if you look at the, what did, uh, you know, how many of the 15 books did Marx actually publish that he was planning to publish, right? It was 15, he's done two out of the 15. And, and so w what does a, a Marxist monetary system actually look like? We, di we didn't quite get to that. Marx didn't survive long enough to actually start really talking about it. And so I, you know, as we work with cooperatives, like one is to say, well, what if, you know, what is a company? Well, in a way, it is a curation of commitments. That is what a company is, right? They, they curate those in the form of a contract that's usually an employment contract, which I would consider a form of uh, wage slavery, right? So the ownership of the employee's time is, is an interesting concept that I, you're a full-time employee. I own all your time versus do I own some amount of your utility, Right. With demurrage, with some sort of expiration on that, I don't have any form of infinite ownership as an "quote unquote" employer. So the 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 effort of mutual service provision or the creation of those types of networks, I think are are really you know. So I I'd love to see factory workers unite and say we're we're going to sell the factory owner this amount of our production, and if they don't agree, we're going to sell it to another factory. And in fact because there's so much ability to do this anonymously and I, I forget the woman who mentioned it earlier but like the ability to do anonymous transactions in this is 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 very powerful so we can support a strike on an organization quite easily by going in and buying the factory workers vouchers and supporting them in that strike without us being labeled as you know the uh, the instigator of a, a union revolt, for instance. So there's a lot of potential for businesses to change how they operate and also be on it. Like if Starbucks can make a voucher, why can't the employees, right? You know, I, there's a lot of, you know, so I think that there, that's one possibility as well. And I think also this is just a normalization. Like the, the fact that this is legal in the US or any country for anyone to make a credit obligation or voucher is a wonderful opening right now, right? So the idea that anyone can come in and say, well, here's my offering. This is what I would like to do. And that that's on a public billboard, which is, you know, for now the blockchain or a blockchain, you know, there, there's an opportunity now to sort of, you know, strike while the iron's hot, while this stuff is still legal. You know, I mean, you know, eventually in some countries already, like I think in Germany, for instance, it's already illegal to do any form of barter. I can't trade a tomato for an orange. That's illegal already. Right. There's a lot of stuff going on like that that's trying to basically say that any form of value expression that it does not route directly through the U.S. dollar, for instance, is explicitly illegal. Right. There's a lot of push toward that. I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, tax obligation and stuff like that, if you're selling these for dollars, well, you're going to pay taxes. You've entered their domain. Fine. But if you're not, well, it's very unclear on how you should be taxed so the, the the closest we've gotten to taxation within government here is that you have the demurrage this expiration part of the redistribution of that ex expiry expired vouchers was going to local chiefs and elders to do dispute mitigation and that was actually a way for them to be part of the system that was actually really nice and so they don't have national currency as but they have a tax in the vouchers themselves, which they have to use locally as well. And so that we've seen some good examples of localized taxa taxation, as well as kind of basic income systems where they're redistributing this taxation to help the elderly and voting on that, that process. Yeah. Thank you. Let's get to Lucille. Lucille. Yeah. Um, so we don't have time for me to fully <laughs> say all I want to. Um, so let me try to be succinct first. Let's go a minute or so after. Lucille, take your time. Get, well, let's, okay. instead of two minutes, you got four. Go ahead, take your time. Okay. So we share a lot, a lot in common, Will. And I am super glad you are doing the work you're doing. I spent the summer of 1977 in West Africa as a biology major, I went back in to my junior year, redesigned my major as third world development studies, a combination of African studies and economics, went back to Africa after that um, in adult education, community-based work in a subsistence farming community in Botswana. And I came back, it was wonderful. I loved it. 
I learned Setswana. I could have spent my life there in some ways, but I knew the problems there were somehow rooted in the international economy. And like it or not, I belonged in the U.S. And in my trajectory since then, you know, led me to, you know, urban living in Chicago, adult ed there, using the city as a classroom, doing a dissertation on value and economics and ethics and education, reading Mouse in that, finding my way to the flaws in modern money in the way that money and banking was institutionalized and, you know, from the medieval times through Renaissance. And um, so, and yet, you know, I found my way to macro level monetary reform through local currency work a conference before the first day of my conference on local currencies in the 21st century. Later, even deeply involved in AMI work, I designed a local currency for the state of Illinois when when the state of Illinois had no budget and higher ed and the school that my son went to, which was a public magnet high school for all of Illinois, had no budget. And they depended on theirs for 85% of their budget. Um, higher ed, you know, it's gotten all this, you know, investor funding over time, created, you know, public schools, created, you know, endowments in the 1980s. Anyhow, um, they didn't buy my suggestion at the state level. It was great. It was a tax tax foundation would enter circulation through public school districts as just an addition to um, salaries, you know, a 2% addition. You see how it works. Anyhow, my question. So I'm really glad you do the work you're doing. Um, I have a book on or that I co-edited on adult on student debt in the U.S. and a chapter in the, my two solo chapters, the second one on monetary transformation and education. I have a section on meso level monetary reform work, which is the local regional currencies work, the kind of all the work you're describing, and it's far more developed as you've described it than you know I've been involved with. That said, my my question really is, and a statement in in that chapter that Margaret Kennedy herself, you know, whom I met at that that local currencies conference, who I've met in person in Germany because I, my spouse is German, um, she before she died, you know, responded to me that yes, you're right about this, <laughs> Lucille, that there it's not an either or. And the macro level monetary reform change work is, is a necessary, not sufficient condition for the kind of um, survival and, and approach to exchange relations that you're describing. And neither is what we're looking for necessary. It doesn't um, make unnecessary um, that that work that you're doing, it makes it easier. Um, and so I probably answer my own question because that was my question to you that I wanted this audience to hear is that we spend our lifeblood and tears and energy on this macro level change for me motivated by the kind of communities and work that you're doing and the effects of the hegemonic US dollar and, you know, now challenged by maybe some other powers that, you know, don't have the military might we do. But what uh, my question is, from your perspective, in the short and middle range, because I think your arguments are right for the long range. But we ain't going to make it to the long range if, you know, we destroy people and planet in the process of getting to the long range. And that's what our extractive credit interest bearing debt based money system, which a crucial point you added in when you answered John was the demurrage. You can't leave that out of your presentation because that was really crucial, the, the, the expiration of the vouchers. So that's, I'm really glad to hear that. Um, but what what is your take? like? about our work, honestly. Do you think we're wasting our time? Is your work, can it become dominant now without 
the ch kind of change at the macro level that we're working for or or not um and yeah that's what i'd like to hear from you honestly Thanks. not yeah. Mm. yeah so can we change huh. macro micro together in unison or should we be thinking about micro and going all the way to the top with it i mean i you know i grassroots is the other you know grassroots economics is the name of the organization and grassroots meaning that like you know one strand of grass doesn't really hold the soil that root you know you need a you need groups to to do so and if you think of society and and governments as some form of you know organization of people for them to create promises to create commitments toward their people is really a beautiful thing and so i i love you know the even in italy i mean the the history of wargle if you ever you know there's some movies out recently there was a reenactment a kind of movie of the war miracle of wargle yeah, which is a, it a, it's wonderful so th there's an example of a small uh, a city in that case making a promise against taxation that was really what it you know essentially was I don't like taxation as the pure promise. I, I, I've i seen governments and municipalities and states starting to look at promises for social services. So promises as well for energy. So you could create a promise, a commitment toward prov provision of X, social services, energy, internet, right? Those are all things that can be tangible promises that we can actually count on and, and create accountability for. So when I think of sovereign money or I think of, you know, uh, monetary reform at the state level, I want those promises and commitments to be explicit in contract. And I want us to have a schema and taxonomy for those that we can all agree on, right? What is the promise? If I'm, I'm looking for that, and I feel like that's, you know, when I look at indigenous systems and I look at pre-capitalist, post-capitalist, you know, uh, dreams, I'm, I'm thinking of, well, can we actually express those promises clearly? And right now, the, the monetary system doesn't do that in any way. It's very hard to see what the promise of the U.S. dollar is, right, other than, you know, subjugation. Do you want to but, say something? So, yeah. but still, you haven't answered, other than I wrote, yeah. that for you to understand, yeah. see a place for macro-level monetary reform, you said you want to know what the promise of sovereign money, of public money, which is very is not what we have now. We have right. extractive interest bearing yeah. debt. That's what we use. Yeah. So what is it like? I I'm looking for like instead of pulling up shop with AFJM and you know starting to do local currency work. Why should I do that? Or why is the work that we're doing that AMI exists to work at, yeah. that AFJM yeah. exists to spread? Why should we keep doing that? And if so, how should we keep doing yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, so I, so I picture it in the same way as I do in the village. It's like here, here you are, you know, looking monetarily at, you know, and specifically you're looking at some form of commitment or promise of the state right now, right? I, what are those? And maybe there's not one, maybe there's many, and maybe it's a pool of promises. So maybe the state can promise X, Y, and Z services, which they are essentially right now doing anyways, right? There's all kinds of funding. Of, well, ex make those explicit in, into fungible, divisible, poolable obligations, right? So if I have a promise for dairy safety, and power provision and hospitals and whatnot make those ex as explicit as you possibly can individually right and then create uh, networks of those that connect to each other so to me like there wouldn't be a national currency there would be 30 or so promises of the state that are pooled together right that would be the equivalent of these more indigenous you know systems Right. So the, the concept of monetary becomes risk pooling among promised services. Define the services first, define them really, really well. And then you build an economy or a quote unquote currency that is the pool of those promises together. And that would be a wonderful state. I'd love to live in that state. Yeah. Thank you. Some, good, some, 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 good for thought. Thank you. Sort of Cheers. like a social libertarian. Libertarians. Um, don't trust the state, but they're willing to work in community. And when they're willing to work in community, they want to know the promises. So 
let's give things a break. And there's more people loving to talk to you, Will. So we may try to snag you some other time if it works out. And um, um, yeah, and and for if you haven't got your questions in, please see the websites and uh, and we need to maybe self reflect as our group with what we learned from Will today and take it another step. I'm willing to sit down with the seal and anyone else who wants to think about uh, Will's work further and maybe Carol both ways, every way. <laughs> and um, so let's, let's take lunch or a break and we'll come back in 50 minutes and we'll take a look at real economy and farmers in life and raw materials and the beginnings of asset mapping as Will calls it in the United States and how we create real economy historically with the idea of pair, power economics and pair, parity. Do stick around, see you in 50 minutes. And thank you again, Will. Okay. Thanks guys, appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, break time. <laughs>